In the earlier days of the channel, I went over the Imperial German battlecruisers. Or, more accurately, the Imperial German Glossekreuzer or Panzerkreuzer, depending. Regardless of what you call them, these ships are an interesting topic to look at. In stark contrast to most navies that follow the British concept of a battlecruiser to some extent or another, the Germans went their own way. They focused on armor and survivability, with firepower pushed a bit to the side to enable fast but tough warships. As such, it wouldn't be until the final design to get past the drawing board that the Germans equaled the British in firepower. That design, known in the modern day as the Airsatch York class, will be the topic of this video. Let's get into it, starting with that interesting name. You see, it was German, and Austrian for that matter, practice to order ships as replacements for older vessels. That is, quite literally, what Airsatz means. Replacement or substitute. So Airsatz York means replacement York, as the name ship would have been a replacement for the unfortunate SMS York. To use another example, the second class of Austrian dreadnoughts are known as the Airsatz Monarch class in historical literature because they were intended to replace the Antique Monarch class. With that done, let's move on to the design history. To begin here, when Germany entered into the Great War, they did so with the Derflinger class as their most modern Grosserkreuzer design. However, even as those ships were being built, a successor was being designed. While not the focus of this video, that successor would eventually take shape as the Mackensen class. These ships, armed with a somewhat unique 35cm gun, were the largest and most powerfully armed German battlecruiser to date. Ultimately, through a long and protracted process, seven of the ships would be ordered. Four would remain as Mackensons, though none of them would be completed. The topic of this video, however, are the final three in the class, Airsatz York, Airsatz Scharnhorst, and Airsatz Gneisenau, which I'm sure I butchered, since that particular name trips up anyone who isn't a native German speaker. That aside, these three ships were eventually pulled aside and extensively modified. Before that, though, another hectic design process had to be concluded. At first, the German naval staff, with Admiral Tirpitz resigning in 1916, looked at much more extensive redesigns. Outright new ships, actually, in the form of the single-digit GK design concepts. These designs, ranging from GK1 through GK6, were universally armed with 38 centimeter guns. Though, I am unaware on any records on GK4 and GK5, or if the Germans just skipped from GK3 straight to GK6. Regardless, GK1 through GK3 were a bit overly optimistic of designs, seeing an increase in displacement as high as 38,000 tons, with engine power going as high as 115,000 shaft horsepower. Between the increase in power, a planned increase in armor, and the move to eight 38 centimeter 15-inch guns, these ships were a market improvement on Mackensen. While GK-6 was an attempt at moving to the fast battleship design the Kaiser wanted, the naval staff didn't like the decrease in speed it entailed, which was 28 knots, without enough of an increase in firepower. The extra armor wasn't seen as worth it. Further design studies, ranging all the way up to GK-12, also exist, but are beyond the scope of this video. Throughout this entire process, the final three, at times even the final four, Mackensons remained in a state of limbo. Often, there were attempts made to scrap them outright and use the material and money to build one of the new GK concepts. For various reasons, not least the fact that a lot of material was already on order, this never came to pass. The seven Mackensons would be built as is, or so the plan went. In late 1916, with evidence mounting of both the Lexingtons being armed with 16-inch guns, and the Renowns with 15-inch weapons, the firepower question came up again. By this point, the first four of the Mackensons were too far along to be modified with heavier weapons. It is not a simple or easy process to increase firepower in that way, past a certain point in construction. This left the Germans with only the final three of the class to modify, 
if they were going to mess with any of them. With enough material already ordered, including the long lead time items like armor and machinery, they had to work with what was available. That meant keeping to more or less the same design, especially as Airsatch York herself had already been laid down. Not far enough along she couldn't be modified, but still already laid down. Even when working with an existing design, though, it didn't stop Admiral Shear from sticking his nose in and wanting the ships to be better in literally every way. He wanted the three GKs to have increased armor, speed, and firepower compared to the four Mackinsons. Evidently, he didn't quite realize that the design could only be changed so much with the time and resources available. Instead, and far more realistically, only the firepower would be improved. Where Mackinson carried eight 35cm guns and four twin turrets, Airsatch York would carry the same number of 38cm 15-inch rifles, in more or less the same layout of a super-firing pair forward and a super-firing pair aft. The aft guns being further apart than the bow ones. This was the major change in the design compared to the previous ships, though not the only one. Part of the reason for sticking to a modification of an existing design was to keep displacement down. This was done, in spite of the larger guns, by sacrifices made elsewhere. Deck armor was reduced and speed lowered to around 27 knots from the 28 of Mackinson, in spite of using the exact same power plant. That being 32 boilers, 24 coal-fired and 8 oil-fired, run through 4 shafts. This produced about 90,000 shaft horsepower, in theory, considering none of the ships ever ran sea trials. On the topic of the machinery, though, this is where the most visible change between the designs came in. While the power plant was identical, Airsatch York, as part of her general increase in size, had a different internal arrangement. This meant that the ship could trunk all her exhausts into one large funnel instead of two smaller ones. It's a very distinct visible difference that also came with some advantages in regard to smoke interference and the like. Moving on though, I don't normally list the length or beam of ships anymore. In this case, I'll make an exception because it is another difference between Airsatch York and her half-sisters. Mackinson had a length of 223 meters, roughly 731 feet, and a beam of 30 meters, roughly 100 feet as well as a displacement of 31,000 tons, rising to 35,300 at theoretical full loading. Airsatch York had the same beam, though she gained about 5 meters in length on her predecessor, that being 227.8 meters, or 747 feet long. This was necessary to maintain a similar length to beam ratio, and thus a similar speed. Displacement, meanwhile, rose by about 2,500 tons to a theoretical normal load of 33,500 tons and a full loading of 38,000 tons. About 1,000 tons of that increase came from the heavier 38 centimeter weapons, with the rest coming from the general increase in size. While I'm on the topic of the weapons, though, Airsatch York lost two secondary guns and two torpedo tubes compared to Mackinson. This left her with 12 15 cm 5.9 inch secondary guns and three submerged torpedo tubes, as well as eight 88 mm anti aircraft guns. To round out her statistics, before I move on to the construction information, such as it is, I will cover the armor protection. This was functionally identical to Mackinson, save for some relatively minor changes here and there, the most notable of which being a slight thinning of her deck towards her stern, though this was a minor change in the long run. Airsatch York would have had an armor belt of 100mm to 300mm in thickness, that being 3.9 to 11.8 inches at the thickest. The exact layout was, again, almost identical to Mackinson, which was itself an evolution of Darflingers. The thickest part of the belt covered the central citadel, while it thinned out towards the bow and stern. With the important note that, while the bow had a 30mm splinter plate, the stern was completely unarmored. Deck armor, then, was similarly laid out. The thinner armor, around 30mm, covering the less important areas, 
while places like the magazine had a thicker 80mm deck. With that done, that just about rounds out the design and technical details, so a short blurb on construction to finish the video. Airsatch York, the only one of the three to be laid down, had her keel laid in July 1916. This was before the redesign later in the year, though she was so early in construction she was able to be modified in line with her sisters. However, she would only ever see her midship section of hull constructed. By 1917, German shipbuilding industries were being diverted to U-boats. While the Mackensons were far enough along to justify at least some work continuing, the Airsatch York sisters were not. In early 1918, the little work that had been done on Airsatch York was scrapped on the slipway, some 26 months from completion. Airsatch Scharnhorst was never begun at all, and the material gathered for Airsatz Gneisenau, notably her diesel generators, was routed to the U-boat program. Specifically, U-151 through U-154 were fitted with her diesel generators. This does, of course, mean that the only complete parts of any of these ships to go to sea were diesel generators stuffed into U-boats. And with that, we come to the end. These were interesting ships, and I personally love the look of the design, but they were never even close to completion. A shame, to be sure, though one can argue up and down how useful they would have been, even had they been completed. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.